All right. So let's begin. So Dr. Dasher was traveling to Denmark for a conference, so he asked if I could give this lecture. And I've taught cardiac physiology before, so hopefully it'll be good. Um, to start off with, I thought what we'd do is I'll just show you, this is what you guys answered in the beginning of the class and the survey, that about 50 to 60% of you felt like you were reasonably comfortable with cardiac physiology. The first part of this lecture set is a lot of physiology review, and the next part goes into a lot of the disease states and treatments and stuff. So the first part is 50% of the time, but I don't want to waste your time if I'm just saying things that you're very, very intimately familiar with. So I'll try to go at a reasonably fast pace, and then you guys just stop me and ask questions if these are physiology concepts that you haven't seen before in other classes, because they're super important to understanding the whole lecture. So let's start with that. So today what we're going to do is I like to, I, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So we posted the problem set two on coursework. It's a lot longer than the first one, but that's because it covers double the lectures. And I think you have over three-ish, three-something weeks to do it. So it's totally doable. And uh, we reduced the math lab because many of you said that we didn't have enough lecture questions. So it's about half and half now for math lab and lectures in terms of time stuff. Come to office hours if you want help on them. I also got a lot of questions about the midterm. And I think the midterm is going to be in class, 75 minutes. And the def difficulty level of questions will be somewhere in between the lecture multiple choice questions and the problem sets. The problem sets are a lot harder because you get a couple of weeks to do them as opposed to doing it in class in 75 minutes. And you'll get one side 8 by 11 paper, just like these white sheets, of any notes that you want to write from lecture slides onto there. We'll be doing tier reviews. We'll cover some of the topics in depth as well. They're not all multiple choice questions, but generally don't expect to do long essays or like long derivations because midterm is only 75 minutes. So they're generally on the, on the realm of shorter length questions, but they're both multiple choice, true or false, short answer, one word answer, one sentence answer, and some of them might be three or four sentence answers as well. One, so one, yeah, one side of a paper this big, standard printer paper. Yeah. And then uh, feel free to do the relevant questions from the final exam in the midterm and ask us at office hours. By course policy, we won't be posting the answers on coursework, but we're happy to share the answers with you in person at any session, like office hours or whatever. OK? Uh, so let's start with cardiovascular system. And I model the system usually as like two things that function side by side. One is like a hydraulic system with like pressures, volumes, pumps, flows. And one is the electrical system. And if you think about these in terms of the two systems separately and then put them together, understanding cardiac physiology is super fun. And it's, it's kind of interesting. So the first question that we're going to ask is, how much blood um, does a heart pump in a minute, right? And so anyone have any guesses or anyone remember from previous lectures? Six liters. OK, six liters. Any other answers? Be interactive. It'll be more fun if you guys throw out numbers and participate. Yeah, 10 is OK. Any other ones? Higher? Yeah, so actually all of these are correct. So anywhere between 4 to 30 liters of blood per minute, depending on your physiological state. We all are resting right now. And if you guys are uh, just sitting there, probably close to somewhere between 4 and 6, 3 and 6, depending on your you know, body, body weight and size. But um, if you were exercising, if you were like running, you could be pumping way, way, way more blood. So that's all normal. And what are the forces you think that drive blood flow in your body? Gravity is a big one. Yes. So pressure gradients uh, and gravity are the two main ones. And then what opposes blood flow is also the same thing. Gravity 
and then shear forces come in as resistance, right? Because the blood has viscosity. The blood's got proteins. The blood has got cells of various kinds. So it's thick. It's not like water, right? Especially if you guys have had blood draws, you see the consistency of blood is very thick. That itself imposes resistance in the form of blood viscosity, right? And then you have obstructions in older people who, over the ages, don't eat healthy, have diabetes, high cholesterol. The things that we studied in the obesity lecture, they form plaques in your blood vessels. So if your blood vessels are normally this thick, and then you have plaques shrinking them this way, then it's going to affect your flows. It's going to affect your pressure. So it's going to affect the whole mechanics of this pump that functions, right? So we'll study the heart as a pump first. I'm not going to go into the atrium ventricles and the big vessels, I'm assuming that you guys all know the parts of the heart, right? So I'm not gonna go into detail about which, where does the pulmonary vein drain into and stuff. That's an expectation that you will know that for this lecture. Uh, so cardiac output is the, number, is the amount of blood in liters pumped out per minute. We said that was between five and 30, right? Now the two things that the cardiac output depends upon are A, how many times does my heart beat in a minute? And B, each time it beats how many CCs or liters of blood does it push out, right? So that is why the relationship is quite simple. Stroke volume, which is in CCs or liters, is the amount of blood that the heart pumps out in a minute. Heart rate is the number of beats. And then you multiply that, you get something in liters per minute. Now, we have this circuitry, right? And there's two circulations that operate independently. One is the pulmonary circulation, which is driven by which side of the heart, right or left? Right, good. So the right heart drives pulmonary circuit, and the left heart drives everything else from head to toe, except for the lungs, right? And that is what this shows. And the reason is for oxygenation, deoxygenation stuff, which we learn in basic physiology that I won't go over. So those are the two major circuits. Arteries are high pressure system, veins are low pressure system, right? So the way it goes is you have heart, large arteries, small arteries, arterioles, and then capillaries, where the actual exchange of nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste products like urea and stuff happens. And then capillaries become venules, veins, go into the inferior vena cava from, down, down the, from below the heart, and then superior vena cava from the head, from the chest, and from the extremities, upper extremities. And then it comes back into the heart, into the right side, right? And then from the right side goes to the lung, comes back to the left atrium, left ventricle pumps this oxygen-rich blood back into the systemic circulation. So that is the basic circuitry of the system you're gonna study. This is just a figure from, I think, the classic physiology book that they always have. The couple of things I wanna point out in here are that the aorta is super large. So I don't know if you guys have taken anatomy labs and stuff, you've seen it, it's like a thick pipe. It's literally like a thick pipe, which is why heart is like a pump and then you've got all these pumps, it's like a hydraulic system. And then vena cava is also pretty big, but compared to the heart, it's not as, hard, like if you've actually felt it, it's, it's a lot, the tissue is a lot different. So the elastic tissue and the smooth muscles between the arteries, aorta, and the vena cava and the veins varies considerably. As you notice, the arteries, arterioles have way more smooth muscle, and then the aorta and the big arteries have more elastic tissue. So they're more elastic uh, properties of these tissues. So let's go into this one. So. This is a graph that I think all of you have seen before. So the questions I want to ask you is, why do you see these oscillations in the area between uh, after aorta and between before capillaries near the arterioles? Why do you see these fluctuations in blood pressure? What is that? Hmm? Pumping of the heart is one, but how does that result in these oscillations? So there's, there's figures to show that, but I'll just do it now because it's more appropriate for this question. You have these blood vessels that have some kind of uh, elastic tissue and some smooth muscle, right? So these are not like, the aorta is more or less like a, a solid kind of tube that doesn't move very much. Uh, it's still, you can still see it fluctuating in the real human, but the arteries above the aorta have a lot of like compliance. So when the blood comes in from the heart, it like expands a little bit. Right? But at the same time, a lot of blood is coming up, so the pressure goes high first, right? And then in the relaxation part of the heart, there's no blood coming in, blood, blood moving forward, and this thing compressing back and shrinking. So you get the fall, and then you get the rise, and you get the fall. And the actual values of why this decreases varies on the size of the vessels that we saw in the past, right? So di different arteries have different sizes, and so the pressure values, the raw values will change based on those sizes. Now, uh, why do capillaries have low pressure? 
Does anyone know, remember? The, yeah. That's exactly right. So capillary, so we know from various physics equations that we'll also re uh, reiterate in the next few slides that if you have a small tube and a big tube, which tube has more resistance? Small tube, correct, right? Because the diameter is really small. Now let's say I have the same amount of flow going through both these tubes, small tube and big tube. Which one will produce a higher pressure? Small tube, right? So it's like, we know the pressure volume relations, kind of like V equals IR for Ohm's law, right? So very simple. But now what happens in capillaries is that you have a million plus billions of capillaries, 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 12, something in that range capillaries, but you got only a few big arteries. So overall, the area of the capillary system is way large, right? So you're not splitting all that blood from the aorta into one capillary. You're splitting it into like a million billion capillaries. That is why the capillary pressure is so low, because the overall surface area is way larger than the surface area of a big artery or, or a vessel. Now the other question to ask is, why is, the, why is there a difference between pulmonary and systemic uh, pressures? So one thing to just give you an idea about, the uh, pulmonary circulation gets the same amount of blood as the entire left side of the heart pumps, right? When the heart's pumping, the left and the right pump equal amounts. It doesn't pump different amounts, because that, that won't work in a closed system, right? So why do you think the pulmonary pressures are generally lower than the systemic pressures? Okay, yes. That is, that is an interesting point. I'll touch back on that right after I hear the rest. Right, so essentially the pulmonary resistance is what's low. So that explains the size of the right heart muscle because what happens is the systemic resistance is a lot higher than the pulmonary resistance. And the resistance is basically a, a derivative of all the capillaries and the vessels in the two systems. So if the pulmonary resistance is really low compared to the systemic resistance, and you're pumping the same amount of blood in each, pulmonary will produce lower pressure because it's just a direct product relationship than systemic would, right? Which is why, as he pointed out, that the right heart muscle has to do a lot less work in the same heartbeat compared to the left heart muscle, and hence the left heart muscle is thicker. So when I give you a heart, you could just quickly look at the thickness of the ventricles and tell this is left, that's right, because right will be thinner than the left one because it works lesser. So these are some basic rules of our circuit. One is that each part of the body gets as much blood as it needs, okay? And this makes sense because after eating, all of us try to go into a food coma, right? Why does that happen? Because a lot of our blood gets shunted from our stomach, uh, from our head all the way down into our gastrointestinal tract to digest and to absorb nutrients. So essentially, you are diverting all your blood flow by eating. I'm not saying don't eat. People should eat food. We need, we need six grams of glucose an hour to survive just to keep the brain functioning, minimal. So you clearly need to eat food. But what happens when we like binge eat or we go and eat like two burgers and fries and an ice cream shake with it, uh, that's when we get drowsy after a while because a lot of blood goes down here to take care of what went in the stomach and the intestines and takes away from the uh, head. The other thing is cardiac output is, um, it's all under nervous system control. So there's, we won't go into the depth of like autonomic feedback loops which control the circulatory system. We'll touch upon some of them, but basically everything's in a feedback loop. So there's receptors that we have in our carotids, in our aorta, other stuff basically that detect changes in blood pressure and then our body will adapt to those changes in blood pressure uh, by changing signals to the heart and to the vasculature, everything. And then the, um, let's see, yeah, so the last line basically says the same thing, that if you have a blood pressure drop, then the heart will do things like contracting the venous reservoir because because of gravity, a lot of blood pools in our legs, right? So sometimes, I don't see anyone doing this. Usually in some lecture halls, people do this. People always tap their foot, right? And they're constantly tapping their foot. What do you think that's doing to your blood pressure or your cardiac output? 
increasing it because you have a lot of blood in your venous reservoirs in the leg because of gravity. So when you get when your when your cardiac output's lower, when your blood pressure is slightly lower, like during the middle of the day you skip lunch, you haven't had enough water, you're going to start tapping automatically sometimes, and that in some sense will actually increase the blood flow back to your heart. And as we know, the more the venous return comes into the heart, the more it pumps out. And we'll study that relationship too. So it's all really fun and interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, no, it appears darker, but not blue. It's probably a representation on like uh, the skin tissue uh, not getting enough blood. Cyanosis is probably from that. It, skin tissue. Oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's, it's mostly in babies who have really, really bad congenital heart disease or lung disease, and they have really low oxygen saturations, levels of which we won't be able to survive, but babies do, they become more blue. Yeah, drowning people, yeah, uh, because they just don't have ox oxygen. So this is the diagram I was drawing before, and the analogy to understand the, um, the capacitance or compliance, I guess, in, in, case, of, in case of these tubes is, think of, think of a balloon, right? The balloon is very floppy. You blow some air in it, right? And so there is an external pressure of the air that the balloon is working against, and then it expands a certain volume. And, that, and how easy it is to fill up a balloon tells us about its capacitance. If, it has a really, it's, if it's made of a material that has a really high capacitance, it'll be a lot easier for us to blow into it because less pressure is needed to fill up that balloon. If it's very, very stiff material, you have to work really, really hard to blow air into it. That's the same principle. If an artery is really, really, really stiff, you're going to have to, the heart is going to have to apply more and more pressure to fill that artery. If the artery is not as stiff in healthy arteries, the heart has to work less to fill that with, to fill that with blood. So that's why with old age, one of the age-related changes that happens in everybody, regardless of how healthy you are, is that your arteries become stiffer as you grow older, by the time you're 70, 80, 90. So as you become stiffer, it becomes harder for the heart by natural decline to fill those stiff arteries with blood. Nowadays, because people are getting more and more obese and having multiple problems, not exercising, getting high blood pressure, diabetes, their arteries are becoming stiffer at younger and younger ages, and so they develop things like high blood pressure, and then their left ventricle starts working harder and harder and eventually causes heart disease when they get older. So the equations that are in here, I think there's so many versions of these, but I think the simple thing that I want everyone to take home is, remember that V equals IR relationship from Ohm's law, basically, Volume equals the product of current and resistance. You apply that to hydraulic system, and the pressure change is a volume, the flow rate, times the resistance of any of these vessels or circuits, right? That's the first thing. So essentially, it's trying to show all that. And then the compliance is basically delta V over delta P. How much volume of any of these tubes changes for every little change in pressure, right? And for a stiff thing, we would expect for a given change in a volume to have a large, large change in pressure for a stiff vessel, which would reduce the compliance, basically. Yeah. Yes. Compliance and capacitance is a direct relationship. It's an analogous relationship. Elastance is the inverse of compliance. So you can look up what elastance is. It's just the opposite formula. And that's the opposite of that. Uh, the other thing to note in this equation is the top one is kind of modeling the balloon, right, which is different because that's P external is the pressure of the air and P is what the pressure inside that we blew in. This equation, P in and E out, is for a tube. So if a tube has pressure one here and pressure two here, it's kind of like the potential drop across a resistor, right? You have V1, V2, and you have R, like R in between, and that's the current that drops the voltage. It's kind of that. To, to make blood flow from one end of the pipe to the other end of the pipe, there's a drop in pressure, and that's what the P1 and P2 represent. So the equations represent different pressure values, but the concepts are all kind of the same. The next thing to remember is cardiac output, we already computed, was stroke volume times heart rate, which is really simple to understand. And blood pressure is just cardiac output times resistance. In the body, we call it SVR or PTVR, which is total peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance. For the pulmonary circulation, we'll call it pulmonary vascular resistance, similarly. This is just basic physics. I won't go over it. Resistance parallel series circuits, like it's kind of fun to analyze um, how that works. And in the body, the majority of circulations are parallel. Because if you go back to our circuitry slide, you'll notice that all these are parallel networks. 
right? They're not in series. So it's like, this is, let's say, the GI circulation from the celiac trunk. This is the kidney circulation. This is the general circulation. And this is the lower leg circulation. They're all parallel branches out of the aorta. So anyone who's taken anatomy has seen, from, down from the celiac trunk all the way to the iliacs, every branch that comes out is its unique parallel circulation circuit. So you would use the parallel uh, thing to analyze that. Uh, also, the first that law is really important. The I don't know how to say it properly, so I'm just going to call it the P law. And you've got proportional to length, and I don't want to make a fool of myself, you know, in the middle of the lecture. So, and then you've got radius to force. So smaller ones, higher resistance; longer length, higher resistance. And then we talked about the n number increasing to 10 to the 9, right? When we were talking about why capillaries have low resistance. So it's pretty simple stuff. And then viscosity is because of the RBCs deforming and other things, other proteins in the blood. And let's see, what's next? So this is like a simple theory that I've kind of already explained. So Vin Kessel or a Vin Kessel theory, and I think Otto Frank also helped design this in the beginning, is that essentially, if you think of the big vessel over here, the bulky one as the aorta, and the other one as a left ventricle, in diastole, there is no flow into the reservoir because the heart is relaxing and filling with blood. So the aorta is not getting any more blood. If anything, blood is leaving the aorta to go elsewhere, right? In systole, this reservoir is filling in from that. So that's basically the diagram that I was trying to draw. This is a prettier version of that, that you fill this in, it expands, and then it leaves, and then it shrinks again. That is what the compliance of these arterial circulation is, right? Um, any questions so far? This is a good pace. It's kind of basic stuff we're just quickly going over, right? All right, so we talked about gravitational forces. People mentioned veins and legs and valves. So this is what happens in normal venous valves. Blood goes down really easily, right? But blood, uh, sorry, uh, for blood to come up without actually regurgitating against it, there has to be a valve that prevents that blood from flowing down. Because we need the blood from the legs to come back to the heart. Otherwise, we can't keep operating this closed loop pump, right? So we have these valves that prevent the blood that's falling down because of gravity from opening these valves and going down. However, in disease states and older people for various reasons, these valves become leaky. So now this is my leg valve, and then there's blood flowing down. If my valve becomes incompetent, is what we call it, then it'll start opening up and leaking blood down. So X amount goes up, normally zero should come back, but now Y amount starts coming back and starts expanding this venous reservoir. So you're storing a lot more uh, blood in your veins and in your legs, and that's how the the thing looks, it's like, it's not a good picture. This one looks horrible. This is, yeah, but there's, this is like not so common to see, but there are many, um, there are many people that have varicose veins and stuff. They don't look that awful. This just felt like dramatic effect. I almost removed it, but just want to show you that that can happen. And you will see these big bulky uh, things show up. Elderly people, yeah. Yeah, correct. So you use mechanical compression stocks that push and add that extra flow like oomph to that and prevent more blood from flowing down because they have that extra added pressure from outside. Questions? Anyway, so this is, uh, this is one of the more important physiology concepts. And have you guys studied Frank Starling law before? Yeah. Do you guys want to review or do you guys know it really well? Let's review. OK, so um, three things we're going to talk about before I go into Frank Starling is the definitions, three definitions that are really Important to understand. Preload, afterload, and contractility. Are those words that you've heard before? No. OK, so preload is what, ha what is present or what, I guess, is the load before the actual work happens. Afterload is what the work is happening against. So think of this in terms of the heart, right? And this is the left ventricle. And this is the aorta coming out of it. The work that's about to happen is that the blood is going to go from the left ventricle to the aorta when it, when it contracts, right? The amount of blood that's sitting in there at the end of diastole. What is diastole? End of filling time, right? So the heart will fill with blood. The end diastolic volume of the left ventricle, right, which is the amount of blood that's present in the left heart just before it contracts is your preload. Does that make sense? And diastolic volume, because diastolic is the relaxation filling time of the left heart and the right heart, right? So left ventricular and diastolic volume would be the preload for the work that's about to happen to pump the blood into the aorta. All the resistance 
that's in the systemic circulation, because the aorta pumps into the systemic side, right, not the lung side, all the resistance in the systemic circulation is technically, the afterload definition technically is a little bit more complex, but for practical purposes, it's equal to this systemic resistance. For a basic physiology class, this definition is pretty good. Technically, it's not 100% not accurate, the resistance, because there's some other factors like, you know how like capacitors have impedances and stuff? So technically, you're supposed to compute an impedance of the circulation, which we won't do. So we'll call it systemic resistance, and we'll call that afterload, OK? So that is what you're pumping against. So we already mentioned stiff arteries have higher resistance, which means the afterload that the, that the heart faces in stiff circulation is higher, right? And then the intrinsic vigor of the heart is what I would say. It's like the best way to describe it. Intrinsic vigor of the heart is going to be contractility. This is also known as the inotropic state. So this is how forceful our contractions are when they happen, right? And contractility is not dependent in healthy hearts about on the uh, preload and the afterload. Or I guess, yeah, it's, it's just an intrinsic property of the heart. So a good heart, like an athlete's really, really healthy heart, has a higher contractility than an old man who's sick with heart disease heart. That heart has poor vigor, and the athlete has good vigor. So higher contractility and healthy disease states, poor contractility, right? So frank stalling relationship is an interesting relationship which basically you know, tells us everything about cardiac physiology. When you have more blood fill in the heart, what happens at the muscular level is that there are these sarcomeres that we studied about in the MSK lecture, right? All muscle is kind of with sarcomeres, even smooth muscle. And so the sarcomeres lengthen because the heart needs to get bigger to hold more blood. As the sarcomeres lengthen, when they're going to contract, they're going to generate a more forceful contraction, right, in healthy hearts. So it's going to pump out more of that blood. So the more the blood comes in, in your diastole, the more will be pumped out. And that is what the frank stalling relationship is. So let's assume the second line, second colored line, or let's say the green line is normal, what they're saying. This is a normal function. So it means as you increase the end diastolic volume from point A to point B, the amount of blood that the heart pumps out in one beat, which is a stroke volume, goes up, right? Because point A, it pumps out this much, and point B, it pumps out this much. So it pumps out this much extra stroke volume. This is kind of what happens when you exercise. When you exercise, I mean, this is a very basic boiling down of exercise. Exercise physiology is super interesting. I mean, we won't go into it. But if you're running, your, your veins are pushing in more blood up because you're contracting your calves and all these muscles, and you're getting more blood to the heart. We already know that we use have cardiac output increases a tremendous amount during exercise. Two reasons for that. What is cardiac output dependent upon? Does your heart rate go up during exercise? Yes. Does your stroke volume go up during exercise? Why? Yeah, because veins push in more blood into the heart. You have more end diastolic volume. You have more stroke volume. That's the mechanism of why you increase your stroke volume during exercise. So this Frank Stalling law is like the classic thing that happens. Now, increasing the blood in the heart is not always a good thing. In cases of patients with poor systolic function, which we'll later learn is like patients with heart failure, which is basically the end result of all heart disease is heart failure, they don't have the ability to actually pump. Their contractility is low, right? We decide the vigor is not there. So in those cases, it doesn't increase the stroke volume that much. And blood just starts to pool and pool and pool because you're increasing the blood in the heart, but the muscle can't, it's, not, it's weak. It can't pump that much blood out. So it's just getting poorer and poorer and poorer. So this indicates good contractility or normal contractility. If I were to draw a graph of one of you healthy people exercising, it'd be even higher, right? Because that heart has, is pumping out more than the volume increases. And then in this case, it's like a diseased heart, which doesn't have enough contractility, and it's just not increasing the stroke volume. Because here, the end diastolic volume is the same in this heart and in this heart. But this heart is pumping almost half as much as this one does, because this is not healthy and this is healthy. So that is basically the Frank Stalling relationship. I highly encourage that you guys understand this super well. Yeah.
I think it, it's because with good exercise, your contractility probably goes up, which is what reduces your heart rate. So at resting time, you don't need as much heart rate anymore because your heart's so efficient at pumping that it, it, it pumps at a lower rate to meet your cardiac output needs. So it's, it, it doesn't mean that anything's bad. It's just good. Your heart's functioning more efficiently. Um, not to say that those of us who don't have heart rates in the 50s while resting are doing any bad. We're doing fine. You know. Um, so this is basically PV loops. A large part of your homework is going to be on PV loops. I feel like if you don't understand fully, it's like fine, but you will understand by the end of your problem set how to work with PV loops. So the end systolic pressure volume relationship. So one thing that we can do really quickly is label some stuff on the PV loop, right? And PV loops are drawn for each ventricle chamber independently. So this is your left ventricular pressures, and this is your left ventricular volume, right? And what happens is you, your heart fills in, fills in, fills in during diastole. This is your end diastolic volume. Then the heart transiently contracts while the aortic valve is shut. It's not open yet. Because remember, there's a small gap between the isovolumic contraction phase. Goes up, right? So the volume doesn't change because the aortic valve is closed, but the heart's contracting with force. But the pressure goes up because the heart's contracting, the valve is shut. So it's generating like this force. So that's that. And then the aortic valve opens, whoosh. And then it like comes down and then it's losing its volume, but it, because of the contraction force, it's gaining pressure, systolic pressure. So this is end systolic pressure, and this is end systolic volume, right? So your stroke volume is what? Because end diastolic was this much, and you pumped out that much during contraction, so you got left with this much. Then your heart starts relaxing and fills up again with this. Right, so end systolic volume, end diastolic volume, end systolic pressure, stroke volume. And then this relationship, this slope of this line represents contractility of the left heart. Pardon me? Yeah, it should be linear. My diagram is not neat. It's usually, you can just draw a linear line. So that represents contractility. And that's basically telling you how much, in, in rough sense, what is the slope of this line? In rough sense, the slope of this line is some delta p over some um, volume, right? So if your heart has, is working to pump out a large volume with, a, with a decent enough pressure, it's high contractility. Whereas if your heart is pumping a decent amount of volume, or, or small volume with the same change of pressure, then it's low contractility. Because it'll go up and down, basically. It's pressure over volume. I won't call it delta P or delta V because that's compliance. But you get the idea. It's like P on this side and V on the x-axis. So don't write delta P over delta V. That's technically not correct. So, so with increasing contractility, the force generation increases, right? And it's not dependent upon loading conditions. Because preload is end diastolic volume, and that's far end on this side of PV loops, right? So that doesn't really change your end, end systolic pressure volume relationship. It's like the intrinsic quality of the heart that determines what the end systolic pressure is. And then you connect it to the end systolic pressure to get your linear line. So in cases of preload, we already discussed when the heart fills in, this is all assuming normal hearts. If the preload increases, we already concluded stroke volume goes up from Frank Stalling law. So you can see that the PV loops get fatter and fatter as the end, end diastolic volume increases. Can you see that change? That's it. That's all that's changing. If you change the afterload, which means the heart has a higher resistance to work against, and it's pumping the same amount of blood, because contractility is the same, notice that all those PV loops on the afterloop curve have the same slope, right? So the contractility is the same. The cardiac output is the same. The heart muscle is healthy. And you've transiently increased the afterload, let's say by squeezing my hand grip like this, because I'm you know, squeezing it. My muscles are compressing on my arteries, and my resistance is going up. So if I do this, my afterload is increasing, but I'm standing here, my heart hasn't changed functioning, my cardiac output's the same, my um, heart contractility is the same. So what's going to change if my resistance increases? Pressure, and systolic pressure, which is why the loops get higher and higher. And to meet that pressure, I'm going to pump out slightly less volume. My PV loops get thinner and thinner. So pressure goes high because I'm applying this resistance by, by like gripping my hands really, really tight. 
or by squatting down, in which case my legs will increase the resistance, and then my loop becomes thinner and thinner. If I change my contractility altogether, which means one heart and two heart, second heart, and I increase this contractility, right? Then for the same end diastolic volume, I'll get a bigger stroke volume. An example of that will be this. It's kind of hard to see. Dotted line and black line, right? Dotted line has higher contractility than the black line. End diastolic volume is 80 cc's in both. Can anyone, everyone see that? OK. So in the heart with low contractility, my curve is this, is my end systolic one. So this, this is my stroke volume in the black line heart, OK? X amount, which would be about 40. In, in the dotted line, the same dotted line heart from here, my stroke volume is this much, which is longer, larger than the previous one, right? And so in a higher contractility for the same amount of preload, I'm going to pump out more blood because my heart has intrinsically more strength and my PV loop will widen. And because the contractility is the one that's different, not the resistance or anything, my slope of ESP or PVR changes. And this is kind of complex cardiac physiology. It took me you know, I've, I studied this first in 2006, and it's 2014. So it's taken me like eight years to develop like kind of in-depth understanding to the point I can teach it. So it takes a while to get it, but it's super important. And the homework set is like a decent percentage focused on this with the simulations that you will learn it really well, and we'll help you in office hours. So if you don't understand everything right away, it's okay. We'll we'll work on it. But you have to understand this much. This is basic physiology. So this is just an example of mitral stenosis. We'll talk about stenosis at the end briefly, but stenosis means the, the valve is thickened and it's not opening as well. So mitral valve helps move the blood from where to where. You guys just have to say it out loud. Mitral valve, left atrium to left ventricle. So if mitral valve is not opening as much, what is happening to your preload? Going down, good. That's what it shows. The yellow curve shows the preload going down Stroke volume goes down. Frank Starling, very basic, right? Next one, aortic stenosis. Now, aorta is pumping blood outside from left ventricle to the body, correct? So if my left ventricle, if my left ventricle is having a harder time pumping that blood because this valve is really thick or diseased in stenotic state, what happens to my afterload? Increase, because it's harder to pump that blood out from that valve, not easier, because it's stenotic, not regurgitant, which would be different. So in stenotic, we already talked about when the afterload increases, your PV loop thins and it rises. So it's kind of quite elementary. Like you use the same three concepts, preload, afterload, contractility, and understand them as independent variables, and then you get this kind of relation. So electrical system, we'll go through really fast. It's basic anatomy. I won't focus too much of it, but SA node is a sinoatrial node present at the top of the right atrium, as you can see there. That is the pacemaker of the heart. It sends out the signal to beat. And all these green lines are specialized conductive tissue in the heart tissue that transmits these electrical signals in pathways that are very well designed. So it goes from SA node to the junction between the atri atria and the ventricles. There's a circular part, which is at the center of both atria and both ventricles. It's called the AV node. So it goes from SA node to AV node. AV node branches to both sides of the heart. And then it splits up into the entire ventricle, and then the electrical impulse causes synchronized contraction. And the heart pumps, relaxes, and then pumps. And the pacing is determined by SA node. So we've got slow response fibers and fast response fibers. And I think the main things to take away from that is the resting membrane potential of the slow response. And the slow response ones are generally the pacemakers of the heart. The fast response are like the normal ventricle uh, muscle cells. Okay, which contract really fast once they get the impulse. Pacemaker is the one that designs what the rate is, and that's slower. So slow is the pacemaker response, fast is the non-pacemaker one. And slower one, you notice that the resting potential is higher than the, the other ones. Do you notice that difference? Resting is about minus 80 there, it's about minus 60 in the slower, right? So it's higher, which means there's some cells, that ion channels, which we won't go into, but there's some spontaneous ion channels by the slow response, slowly, 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 depolarize, depolarize by itself, and then it fires, and then relaxes, comes down. Again, by itself, slowly, slowly, slowly depolarizes because there's some resting set, uh, channels that are active all the time without any impulse, and it fires again. And then same thing happens. So that gives it an internal clock, like a rhythmicity. You don't need, like, in the muscular junction, we study the action potential comes in, then things get released, then the muscle fires, whatever, right? In these slow pacemaker cells, they don't need external input. Their cells and their physiology are designed 
such that this, the potential resting is higher already, closer to threshold. And then it kind of automatically makes its way over slowly, slowly. And then it fires and then relaxes. And then it automatically makes its way over slowly and then relaxes. So it's pace making activity. In the fast response, you actually have sodium channels where the impulse needs to come there, touch them, open sodium channels, sodium comes in, and then it fires. Pretty traditional, like neurons. So that is the difference, yeah. the latter, the muscle. So yeah, I, when I said this, pacemakers are by themselves independent and they have their own clock, that's partially true because there is a nerval, nervous system control, which is the parasympathetic tone from the vagus nerve. And so what happens is they, the, the channels that I told you that operate in this phase zero of the slow, they are under parasympathetic innervation, those channels. So it's not from the heart, it's from the brain or from the nerve. And so those channels in the phase zero are controlled by the vagus nerve. So what happens is, when, you, when your muscle has gotten stronger and you realize you don't need that much cardiac output when I'm sitting, because I'm an athlete, like when I'm sitting, I'm not using that much blood, why do I need that much? Then the brain and the, re the reflex systems adapt to use the vagus nerve to tone down your pacemaker and make it less, because you don't need extra blood when you're just sitting here. You know, it's uncomfortable. So you become relaxed and you still get the same perfusion as everybody else does, so, because your heart's pumping out more with each beat. So, um, I already talked about SA node controlling host rhythmicity. This is what I'm telling you. The slow response fibers are present on AV node, SA node, and some in the Purkinje also have some firing system properties. And the reason why sinoatrial node activates the AV node and not the AV node is because if you notice the basal rates, the internal rates are higher in the SA nodes, between 70 and 100 usually. So it usually supersedes. There are diseased pathology where SA node is damaged because of something, in which case the AV node will sometimes take over and we call it junctional rhythms and they're bad and then we treat them and then it's a different story, but don't worry about that. So this is basically why the AV node has a slower frequency of firing naturally on SA node is because they have less gap junctions. You know, gap junctions just holes which exchange ions and cells. This is just a picture of how EKG is taken. I wouldn't worry about EKG, that's a way to advance, just kind of to show you what this looks like when we connect electrodes on our chest, and any of you will have EKGs that will look similar. Um, this is just like a quick pictorial representation of signal transmission. The red lines are the electrical signals, and the blue line shows how those electrical signals contribute to the EKG. So it's just for your viewing pleasure, so you can watch it at the end. Uh, this diagram, I won't go into detail because I could spend like an hour just talking about this whole thing. But I think the main idea is that we studied electrically and hydraulically, this kind of combines it and puts it all together. There's pressure volume relations, there's the EKG, there's volume, like volume pressure EKG all in one. And you can see with each phase of the heart where the contraction is, where the valve opens. I really recommend that you guys sit down with this figure for a while in groups or by yourself and just walk through the cardiac cycle and see if you understand everything on this. Like I won't go over this right now because it'll take forever, but this is everything we've covered and everything that you've known from previous lectures all put together in one diagram. And this covers a lot of what we've studied. So what can go wrong? Tissue damage. So heart is actually, while it's inside in like big accidents, like car accidents or something, your bone can actually hit the heart muscle and cause contusions. So you can get direct trauma, which will destroy the muscle a little bit. It can, heal over time. Uh, infections, so there's three layers of the heart, which we didn't go over, but each of them can get infected. Valves can get infected, so heart tissue can get damaged from infection. And then other causes, like drugs, cocaine. I've seen so many patients in the county hospital who are addicted to cocaine and their heart gets destroyed by the age of 30. It's terrible. Um, amphetamines, I think, can sometimes do it, I think, if abused incorrectly, but not that much as cocaine. Cocaine is probably the worst one. Ischemic damage. Cocaine constricts your coronary circulation. And as you know, if your circulation constricts, you get less blood than you need. And your heart tissue gets slowly, slowly ischemic damage and causes heart failure. It's kind of like having coronary artery disease from plaques, but not having plaques and having the same effect. So cocaine is not good for anybody. I hope none of you do it. Uh, coronary occlusions is just plaques in the vessels which can be from stuff that shoots out, like an embolus from the valve. Sometimes valves can develop like vegetations and flicker out into the vessel and block it. 
or you can have people like in the obesity lecture when we studied like diabetes and atherosclerosis from high cholesterol, high, high sugar levels, the, the t plaques start building at the side of vessels and then it clogs. And once it clogs completely, then it's a heart attack. Uh, aneurysms is a kind of outpouching of big vessels or small vessels, mostly arteries. Valve problems, which we talked about stenosis, we talked about one. Regurgitation is the opposite of stenosis, where valves are not tight, but leaky. And then electrical abnormalities, where there's issues in the, the green pathway of electrical conduction that we studied. So this is just kind of statistics from before. I didn't update them, because uh, it would take a while to find these. But basically, it's gotten worse, not better. Take home point between 2008 and 2013. So I won't belabor it, but everyone knows that heart disease is a big big issue in the country. So what happens when plaques build up is the effective area of blood flow in the vessel decreases, correct? From physics, you know that when that happens, you can get turbulent blood flow. So that's not good, right? Secondly, you get less blood flow. That's not good either, because the heart needs blood to work. So people who start developing heart disease when they're old start getting chest pain. All chest pain is not a heart attack. If you're lucky and you're getting heart disease, you'll begin with angina, so someone will know that, oh, you're starting on that track. Let's put you on meds. Let's get you taken care of so you don't get a heart attack, right? Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes people just get heart attacks straight away. So heart attack is when it completely blocks the vessel. In angina, it's just plaque buildup, which causes ischemic pain, like pain when a 70-year-old man is jogging which he does not used to get before, but now he started getting chest pain. It's like, oh, your arteries are not functioning as well. Your heart's getting less blood when you're jogging. That's like the first sign usually. And then in myocardial infarction is when the artery gets fully clogged. In that case, your tissue is not getting any blood supply at all. That's dangerous and life-threatening. So you got to go to the hospital, get that clot taken out, and you live. But if you don't get it taken out, then that's not good. Uh, it's referred pain sometimes, and sometimes um, it's referred pain, right? Yeah, it's just the innervation. Sometimes when the when the heart gets ischemic in the points near the diaphragm, you get pain closer to that diaphragm area. The diaphragm area has neural innervation from the cervical nerves, which are C five, six, seven, I think. Arms in heaven, no, three, four, five keeps the diaphragm alive. C three, four, five. So yeah, so from the neck. And so essentially, if that area gets irritated, you're going to get referred pain to the back of the shoulder, arm, jaw, neck, because it's in that area. So it's referred pain. It's not direct blockage to the arteries, to the jaw, or anything. Correct. So I'll explain that. So we'll go over coronary circulation. But as you can see, there's a coronary map there. They're all distinct arteries in left and right heart, but they have some connections. So when one gets blocked, there's collateral circulation that can take care of it for a little while, but not too long. If all of them get blocked at the same time, those people generally do die. And that's badness. Generally, it happens one vessel at a time. Oftentimes, when one vessel gets blocked, you take them to the cath lab to see the visualization, and they see that all three are super diseased. In that case, they just go ahead and bypass all of them, and we'll go over the treatment in a little bit. But yeah, you're right. Like if, if the critical one gets blocked, then it's going to not function very well. The main arteries that get blocked usually are coronary arteries in the heart, carotids in the neck. They don't get blocked, but they get plaque buildup, because carotids are fairly big compared to coronary arteries. Splenic, mesenteric, iliac, femoral, the diagram is up there. So we talked about this flow, turbulent flow with plaque buildup, Reynolds number, physics nightmares, or physics happiness, whatever you guys prefer. Um, and then you guys can study that. Um, what? And then vascular system aneurysms, abnormal enlargement in the arteries caused by damage or weakness, mostly hypertension related, atherosclerosis related. Atherosclerosis is just plaque buildup. And that's an MR angiogram of a real person's aneurysm. Now, these are risky because they can burst, causing death fairly quickly. They can dissect into other arteries, which means they can affect end organs and cause strokes. Arm can get lost because it might go into one of the subclavians that would supply the arm, things like that. So they're fairly 
dangerous, but when they're not too large, they're not too bad and you can just manage them medically. When they get above a certain size and you monitor them every year or something, then you have to surgically treat them or there's stents to put in those as well, like endovascular grafts and all this fancy stuff. Uh, I've seen worse, but in aneurysms in aorta are probably the most common. Next would be cerebral, I think, brain, which is linked to kidney disease sometimes. Um, so it causes hardening of arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes. Syphilis can cause aortitis, which is inflammation of the aorta. So syphilis can cause everything, but we don't see all the manifestations anymore because people get treated very quickly. Great pretender. Marfan syndrome is like a disease where you see these really, really tall, thin, lanky people, really, really tall and like long, long arms and legs. Don't say everyone like that is Marfan's, but yeah. And then they get aneurysms almost always by the age of 20. It's kind of sad. They have to get multiple heart surgeries, but they have to deal with that. Um, and then valves, stenotic valves and competent valves, we talk about that. Causes are rheumatic fever, infections, wear and tear. Aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis is a common one with old age. It just kind of gets spoiled, and people get aortic stenosis when they get much older, like 80s, you know? When I say old in this case, I'm not talking about like 50. I know you guys are really young, and 50 is like old for you, but 50 is relatively young in the medical world. 60 is relatively young. 65 is young. I think 75, 70, 80 gets old in medical world somewhat, and that might be changing too. This ball and cage one is like a traditional like olden valve. It's never used now. If you see a patient with this in the OR, they get really fascinated, you know? Like these are patients who got a valve surgery at 50 years of age and now are coming back for a redo surgery at 80. And they're like, oh, there's a ball and chain in there, whatever, so it's fun. And then this is cardiomyopathy. We can discuss this more at office hours because it's kind of interesting and helps you tie in all the physiology a little bit better, but there's three main kinds. Dilated, where the ventricles get dilated. Hypertrophic, which is the one that athletes die from all the time in that sudden collapse, you know, when you hear Berkeley student suddenly collapse, like 20 years old or an athlete elsewhere, that's almost always hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the reason is that you have this, this bulge. Look at this, and look at this, and then look at that. Kind of thick, huh? The intraventricular septum gets a very thick muscle because of a genetic defect in a protein that's called titan, no, what is it, titan dystrophin, I don't know what it is, something. And it basically, makes the ventricle small because it bulges into the left ventricle. And so can you, basically less blood here. So more obstruction to blood flow, which makes their chance of getting a cardiac arrest from an arrhythmia very, very high. And that's how they suddenly collapse because in exercise their heart can't, it just doesn't meet the requirements. That's why they screen athletes very carefully with heart exams to see if they don't have murmurs and stuff. And I think any of you, if they're athletes, you probably have checkups and uh, physicals and that's what they listen for. Uh, so they prevent that, so the rate has gone down a lot. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is from other diseases which just make the heart harder to pump out. Um, the muscle gets the problem in that case. And then heart failure is what we'll talk about, so I won't spend too much time in here. Basically, any of these heart diseases that we discussed, any of them, except maybe aneurysms, result in heart failure if untreated. Coronary artery disease or the, any of these kinds of myopathies which we discussed, they're all basically leading to heart failure at the end of it. And that the re that's the re because the definition of heart failure is anything that causes the heart to not pump as it used to normally. Very simple. So any of this stuff can cause heart failure if untreated. So there are many reversible causes. So there are people who come in heart failure floridly from pulmonary embolism or something. If you fix it, their heart can be fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happens in dilated cardiomyopathy. Originally, like from alcohol can give dilated cardiomyopathy to like very, very severe alcoholics. It's not very common. But so in that case, the heart it originally will try to compensate. And in that compensation is when it gets dilated. But eventually, over time, it's just going to fail. So initially, a dilated heart can function fine for a while. And then it slowly, slowly fails. This is not very instantaneous. These are very gradual changes. So we'll go over that a little bit more. And then um, you guys can read this about preload, afterload oxygen. It's very interesting. It's kind of useful because we covered all of this, but I want to spend more time on it. Brief overview of treatments for occlusions is very easy. You take a, take a wire in from the femorals, go up the heart, and then break the plaque, or a balloon, or group stent deployment. And then various drugs, you guys can look at that, and you'll have to look at that for your case study assignments. I won't go over that much. 
and then bypass surgery is when you take a vessel from the leg or from the mammary artery, and then you create a conduit. So you, you, you basically leave the vessel like this disease, and then you create a bypass. It's cool engineering-wise, right? You just create a different circulation pathway. And where does circulation prefer? Path of low resistance or high resistance? There you go. So that's, what, that's how bypasses work. And then pacemakers for arrhythmias. We didn't talk about arrhythmias because they're very advanced, but basically even the heart doesn't function properly, we can insert these devices that help control the heart a little bit better. So this is a patient, and this is going to be interactive, so you guys have to pay attention because you have to come up with a diagnosis in class. You won't be doing it at home. Um, so patient comes in with shortness of breath. So Mr. M is a 62-year-old guy who comes to the emergency department because he's been having difficulty breathing. It's been getting progressively worse over the last week. Uh, but he has been kind of having breathing difficulties for a while, like a couple years. So he's now short of breath at rest, like experiencing chest pain even with like a little bit walking. He also has gained 15 pounds over the past 10 days. Despite taking all of his medications, his feet appear really swollen and painful. At baseline, he sleeps sitting up because when he sleeps laying down, he becomes increasingly short of breath and gasps for air and wakes up at night. So he sleeps sitting up now. If you had asked him, he'd say, oh, first I have to use one pillow, then two pillows, then three pillows, and I just sit up and sleep. With this limited information, what do you think might be the primary cause of Mr. M feeling short of breath? Let's, let's start it. Kind of a biased question, but. All right, answer number four, which is inability to hydro pump both. Excellent, you guys were paying attention during lecture. Can anyone explain why he's short of breath? Huh? That's, that explains the chest pain, that he's having pain with walking means something is not right with his heart. Yes. There's nothing wrong with his lungs by default. So if he's breathing, his lungs are supposed to be okay. There's something that the heart is doing to his lungs that is causing this problem. Okay, those are all great answers. The way to understand this is you have the left side of your heart, right? And you have the left ventricle, and you have the aorta, and then you've got pulmonary, uh, is it the pulmonary vein, right? That comes into the left after you. Tired. So, what do you think happens when this heart can't but pump but blood efficiently? Hmm? It backs up into the lungs. That's what happens. Because if the end diastolic volume will go up, right? If the heart cannot pump it, because it's going to stay, eventually this valve, the mitral valve, which causes blood to come in from the left atrium to the left ventricle will face more and more resistance because it just can't fill anymore. I mean, there's only so much blood that can fall into the left ventricle. So it fills up. When it fills up, the pulmonary circulation gets backed up and, and water, essentially water, starts leaking in from the capillaries, from the pulmonary circulation because pulmonary capillaries can also hold only so much. The water has to go somewhere. So it goes into the lung sacs, the alveoli, which breathe, which we learn about in respiratory system, the anatomy. So the lungs fill up with water. That's what causes shortness of breath. That's what decreases oxygen saturation and causes shortness of breath. Questions? Pushes it down. So then frees up more of your space to breathe. Because when you're lying down, all the capillaries have the same gravity. So everything gets out into top lung, middle lung, and lower lung, because you're lying down, and your lungs are like this, flat. When you sit up, gravity pulls all the water down to the bases, and it collects near the diaphragm, and leaves the remaining lung free to breathe. Kind of cool, right? That's one of the screening questions we ask when patients are going to heart failure, is like, how many pillows do you use to sleep at night? And they'll tell you they increased it, because it's so much more comfortable sitting up, because the water doesn't fill the lungs anymore. The majority of it is empty. So, Past medical history, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol, two myocardial infarctions, high heart attacks in 2000. This is not a very strange story. I wrote this case from scratch. These are patients, like many of them I've seen in clinic all the time. It's not very strange. Myocardial infarctions in 2011, blockage in LAD, which is left anterior descending artery from the left main. There's two main circulations in the heart, right coronary, left coronary. 
the left main has two branches, left circumflex, which is LCX, and left anterior descending, which is LAD, and then RC is the right side. And there's multiple branches and some collaterals that we talked about. So they got two heart attacks, one in blockage in LAD, and one blockage in RC and LCX. And because the first one they put a stent in, because it was just one, and other ones seemed OK. The next one, two years later, they found that both of them had a horrible stenosis, and the stent wouldn't really work well. So they did a cabbage, which we studied in lectures, just bypass with surgery, by open heart surgery. And then he had mild chronic kidney disease. Someone asked in the renal lecture why someone with heart failure might develop chronic kidney disease. Any answers? You guys think about it. It's a question for homework, but someone asked it, and I think we said the answer last time, but just think about it. It's not that hard to get why he would have kidney disease because of heart failure in this case. Obesity, because he has BMI of over 30. Smoked before, quit in 2011 after his first heart attack. No uh, alcohol after that, no recreational drug use. He's taking these medications. One of your assignments is to understand what these do in heart failure, so we won't go over this right now. So this is his physical exam. He feels breathless. His blood pressure is really low, 85 or 51. That's kind of concerning. His heart rate is high. It's 104. That's a little concerning because it already can't pump very much. Now you're trying to pump it even faster. I don't know what would happen to his filling state. It would be just poor, poor things for this guy to have this blood pressure and heart rate. Respirations are 24. Each of us is breathing like 10 to 12 mi per minute, maybe 14. 24 is kind of high. It's like, like fast, like every two seconds or so. Uh, he says, I can't breathe, I don't want to die, he's obese, he's in acute distress, his neck veins are distended, they're pumping up with blood. Now you can think of the backup logic from the right heart, because if the whole heart isn't working, because he had infarctions in his right circulation and left circulation. So we've been always talking about left ventricle when we do all this calculation, right? We can do the same for right ventricles. We can have a right ventricle PV loop, right ventricle and diastolic volume, similar stuff. So then the blood will pool up into the um, right side, which would be the venous system, so jugular veins here. And then he's got rouse over his lower bases in the lungs, which basically are the sound you hear when there's water in the lungs. Cough, productive of frothy sputum, which means the water is coming up as cough. S3 gallop basically means when the heart fills in with blood and diastole. In normal people, you don't hear an extra sound. You hear blub dub, blub dub, blub dub, and everything's happy. When the heart's dilated and there's too much blood in there, think about taking an empty pot of water and throwing in a glass full more on there. It'll create that sound. That's what the gallop is. So when the heart's dilated and it's like filled up already, then on top of that, you throw in some more in diastole. It's just going to create this whooshing sound, which creates the S3, which is a third abnormal sound, because two are normal, third is abnormal. And then liver is palpable lower, again, backup of the venous circulation from the portal veins and the inferior vena cava. So all that stuff, four plus spitting edema, which means he has fluid in his legs all the way up here. So clearly his heart's in terrible shape. He's like retaining water everywhere, on the left circulation, right circulation, everywhere. So he feels he's going to die. Chest labs note that his creatinine, which is the indication of kidney function, rose from 1.4 to 2.1 on admission. 1.4 was already high. One is about normal. 1.4 was his chronic kidney disease, probably from his heart condition. You guys will figure out why. And now it's getting worse in this admission. His anemia, which is fine, low-grade anemia. And then his liver enzymes are rising a little bit. He's got no hepatitis or nothing. So why are his liver enzymes rising? So his kidney function is falling. His liver function is falling. His heart's already failing, as we established. We look at his EKG, and it shows evidence of old MIs, which we talked about, but no new MI. So his chest pain is not from like an actual blockage right now. And then his chest x-ray is, this is normal. That's his patient. You can see all the whiteness. That's all the fluid. That's how our chest x-ray will look, hopefully. And that's how they, this guy's look, because his lungs have got a lot of water in them. This is his coronary cath from 2013, which shows the blockage and stenosis in RCA and shows the stenosis in LCX. This is probably stentable. I made the patient unstentable and gave him a cabbage, so you guys know that cabbage can be done. This is not his picture, obviously. This is a sample picture from online. But that's kind of what a coronary cath looks like with the dye. You take extra film, then you can see the vasculature. This is what a normal beating heart looks like. You see it's pumping really well, right? Valves are moving, opening, closing, blood flowing. It's pretty nice. This one is this patient's heart. Is it pumping anything at all? It's barely contracting. And it's very dilated and ballooned up. Like, you can't even tell that the muscle is actually coming in. It's like pretty bad. So what is the patient's diagnosis? I already said the diagnosis several times in the presentation. Heart failure, likely from multiple infarctions in the past, because each infarction kind of takes away some of your function. 
Because every time you have heart attack, we talked about ischemia, we talk about tissue not getting enough blood, not getting enough perfusion. If you're lucky, you get the stent placed in quick enough that the perfusion restores, heart's fine, but that may not be the case. And everyone reacts differently. So this guy had all three main vessels damaged at some point or the other, which means a large portion of his right and left heart was ischemic for some time and suffered. And that's why he has heart failure, which has worsened over the last three years, right? So our questions are, so he has a heart failure exacerbation. That's what you would call it. You would say the patient is admitted with a congestive heart failure exacerbation to the hospital. So he gets, and we find out that he has been in the hospital back and forth over the past year, and each time his heart function has worsened. His ejection fraction on the echo, which we, do, which we did, was 21%, which was down from 30% two months ago. Ejection fraction in us would be somewhere between 55 and 60%, 50, 50 to 60%, 55 plus in all of us, 55 to 65. That's a significant drop, right? 20% is like nothing compared to 55, 60%. And you guys should know how to compute the formula for ejection fraction. It's kind of fun to work out. It's very simple based on stroke volume and end diastolic volume. And so patients with end-stage heart failure fall into two categories. You can read about those. Our patient is probably has advanced structural heart disease. He's pretty sick. We made him pretty sick in the case. We wrote the case, so we made him really sick, right? He's end-stage heart failure. And um, he's getting symptoms at rest, despite all the medications he was on, which you'll have to study what they're for. And the one-year mortality, which means the death within one year of advanced heart failure is pretty high, 50% mortality. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna work through taking care of Mr. M by answering the following questions. One is you're gonna look at his medications. I broke them down into five sets. You're gonna interpret for me what each of the set of medications is for. Some of them are really easy and everything should be Googleable, but I think I want you guys to talk about it and understand why those medications, especially the ones in set two and three. For one, four, and five, you can just say what the meds are for and forget about it. For two and three, a little bit more explanation on why they're helpful in heart failure, like what is their mechanism of action and why it helps. Second part, we talked about the creatinine rising to 2.1 from 1.3. So to extend the renal, because we don't have a separate renal case, I'm incorporating a little renal in here. Why do you think this value increased? Why did kidney function get poorer over time in the, in the past two or three months? And his liver enzymes are starting to rise as well. So what can you say about his circulatory state for his systemic circulation during this time? Third question, the patient is admitted to the CCU, which is the coronary care unit. What are some of the things you can do to support this patient in the hospital until a more definitive treatment plan is created, right? Specifically, answer two questions. What can you, help him, what can you do to help him breathe better slash remove fluid from his lungs? There could be two or three ways of doing this that I can think of. And support his cardiac function. His contractility is like so poor, it's not contracting. Can you do anything to make his heart beat faster pharmacologically? Or not faster, better, not faster, better. Um, and think of which variables, preload, afterload, and contractility is a problem. I kind of give you the answers to all of this, but you'll have to think about it. Assume that any reversible causes have been fixed. That means his bypasses are working fine. It's just his heart muscle is not good anymore. And the patient is in CCU for days, needs a lot of hemodynamic support to keep his body going. Identify some non-pharmacologic, that means non-drug-based interventions. The first three talk about drug-based interventions for someone in end-stage heart failure and specify how they work from an engineering standpoint. And we will build on this list next time to talk about